You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. These people now know that their nation has gone away, that the temple has been destroyed. There's nobody in Israel now, nobody. Uh, They're all in captivity. The northern kingdom has disappeared into Assyria. The southern kingdom has gone into Babylon. Babylon has conquered Assyria, and that's all now Babylon. And they're despondent. The temple's gone. Well, the northern kingdom has been gone over 200 years. So into that world comes the message of God. The story of Israel has been tumultuous at times, and it's still being written. God is not surprised by any of it, as he is at work orchestrating every detail. In today's teaching, Pastor Ken will show listeners where the disbanding of Israel began and how God used Ezekiel to speak more prophecy. The Lord is in the business of restoration and reunification, and Israel may be the greatest example of that. How can you grow your understanding of history so you can better understand the happenings of our day? Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, as he begins his message, The Reunification of Israel. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We just thank you for how much you love us and you continue to show us your truths as we study your word. It's exciting to be in a section of the scripture that we start reading and then we start saying, well, that's happening today. Lord, it's really exciting to be reading this and to be studying and to to see how true the prophecy is. Just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Lord willing, we will finish chapter 37 and we'll start talking about chapter 38 and 39, a little thing called the Gog Magog War. Uh, There's a lot in it. But tonight, what we're going to be talking about is the reunification of Israel, which obviously, if you read the news and you see what's going on in the Middle East today, you kind of go, well, hasn't that happened? Well, yes and no. I mean, one of the things we've been talking about as we've gotten to this section of Scripture is a lot of what you see in prophecy is the, uh, the picture of, yes, it's in existence, but not yet. And, and you kind of go, huh? How does that work? Well, that's what he's trying to show us. But we're going to look at the last section of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 37, verses 15 to 28, And uh, remember, we looked at the Valley of the Dry Bones, or as I call it, a kosher Jew's worst nightmare. Because remember, they're not supposed to be in and around dead bodies. They're not supposed to be in and around all the bones. And where does God deposit him? Through the power of the Holy Spirit? In a valley full of dead bones. And then he says, oh, take a tour. Go walking around it. I mean, that's not exactly what he wanted to do. But Ezekiel, by this time in his ministry, is used to the fact that if God says, do it, he does it. And he's obedient. So he walks around, and then he's told to talk to these bones. And it winds up being the day of the living dead. They all start coming back together again, and they stand up, and they, they become people, but no breathing uh, and no life. And, and, and by the way, when you look at that, we see the same thing today. But just as we look today, we see the land, and we go into the land, and we see that Israel's back in the land, but they're not in belief. So just as we see the bodies all standing up but not doing anything, uh, that's a picture of Israel today. And, but, and then, but then you see uh, Ezekiel has to breathe on them. Well, what's that all about? You know, you, uh, Isaiah, by the way, in Isaiah 66, 8, Isaiah makes a prediction as well that actually happened in 1948. Who has heard such a thing and who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Yeah, it was in 1948. Uh, Israel declared to be a nation. And it was literally born in one day. And for the first time in the history of the world, a people who had been out of the land for 2,000 years were back in it. And guess what was their language? Hebrew, which was considered a dead language. It's not a dead language anymore. Now it's a living, live language. Uh, So what we've got is basically, even though the house of Israel felt forsaken, but they're not. They're, They're absolutely not. Uh, they they weren't. They were still his people, and we can see that today. We see that God is still working miracles in his nation. He's still working miracles in his people. He's still working through them. He's still talking to them. And as a result, we now see the nation back in the land. And we also talked about the fact that not all of them are in belief, but some of them are. 
we have an already but not yet kind of scenario. Because we see here that there's going to be a point where the whole nation loves the Lord and serves Him. But what we've got at this point is not the whole nation. It's just a portion of them. But they're back in the land. And it's really interesting. By the way, how long did it take for Israel to become a nation? The restoration, the, f- the flesh being put together, all of that happened again, like we said, in one day. It was May 15th, 1948. And, and we've had a, another study where we took a look specifically at some of the promises in the Old Testament, some of the warnings and the, and the things that go on in the Old Testament. And it, it actually talks about their punishment being multiplied seven times and all these other things. And it, it, it all points to the fact that, well, they, something should happen on May 15th, 1948. It did. Uh, that's when David Ben-Gurion declared Israel to be an independent nation. The very first nation that said, we recognize Israel as a nation was Iran. The second nation was the United States. But it's always funny when you see everything that's going on, that the very first nation to recognize Israel was Iran. And then Russia was third. Would that happen today? Probably not. But that's what happened. It, they became a nation in one day, literally, just as the Scripture says in Isaiah. And when was Israel to return? Now, per Zephaniah, it says that when they do go back, they're going to speak Hebrew. So in Zephaniah 3.9, it says, Indeed, then I will return my people to a pure language. That's Hebrew. God considers that to be a pure language. English is not a pure language. Hebrew is. We will probably all speak Hebrew through the ages. So if you don't like funny little sounds coming in the back, get used to it. You're going to have it happen. But he calls that a pure language. I don't know. I don't know that for sure. I'm just, it might be. But Zephaniah 3.9 says that when they come back, they're going to be speaking Hebrew. And when they came back, guess what they were doing? Speaking Hebrew. So we're seeing Scripture being fulfilled. Phase one already, but not yet. They're supposed to have the Spirit next. So let's take a look at verses 15 to 23. Uh, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and ride on it. Now, he remember, he's the, uh, he's the acting prophet. He's the one that does everything by shows. And he started off the book by laying on his side for uh, the better part of 11 months, and then on his other side for the better part of two months. And he's also dug holes through the wall, and he's done some really goofy things. So people are used to him having a show. I mean, it's kind of like, let's go to Ezekiel's house. We have no idea what he's going to do today. So now he's being told, he takes, and it says, and you son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick, so he's got two sticks, and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them together, so then put both of them in one hand, into, uh, into one stick, so they become one in your hand. When the sons of your people speak to you saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the, in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I'll put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. The sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations, plural, not just a couple where they were at this time when this was written, where they have gone, and I'll gather them from every side. Well, they only went to the north. What do you mean, every side? Well, it's because he's talking about a future event that when he's writing this hadn't taken place yet. It did happen in 135 A.D., and bring them into their own land, and I'll make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them. And they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. And they will be my people and I will be their God. So God is once again using our performance prophet and he's doing another show. Now he's playing with sticks. And he takes two pieces of wood, and he's told to write something on it. So, by the way, what was the condition of Israel as a people prior to the death of Solomon as a nation? What happened as a result of Solomon? Okay, so we go to 1 Kings chapter 11, and we look at verses 9 to 13. And we find out what happened. Remember, they were one nation. David had taken Jerusalem. Solomon, his son, became king. Solomon ruled. 
he had a, a, a little problem with women. He had several hundred concubines and wives. And then he did some things he wasn't supposed to do. So verse 9 of 1 Kings. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and you've not kept my covenant and my statutes which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom. I'll give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem which I've chosen. God told Solomon he was going to divide the kingdom because of sin. He made it very clear. Then he adds some more information for us in 1 Kings chapter 12, over in verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, this is when the new king comes in, and they ask the new king, hey, Solomon, your dad made us work real hard. We don't want to do that now. Can you make things a little lighter for us? And he took it under advisement, came back the next day and said, nah, I'm going to add to it double what my dad did. And here's what the people reacted to it. They saw that the king did not listen to them, and the people answered the king saying, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. That's basically them saying, we're not going to stay here any longer, we're leaving. Uh, now look after your own house, David. They basically rebelled against him at this point. So Israel departed to their tents, but as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam said Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. So much for his, his uh, <laughs> management style. And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. It came about when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. So what we're seeing in that section of scripture is the nation is divided into two. Israel is all the other tribes and Judah winds up being Judah and Benjamin. And what we'll see is that there's several other tribes that do come to join them. But in 931 B.C., the people became two nations. Okay, So kind of mark that. 931 B.C., they divided. So we have ten tribes in the north. They formed what's known as Israel or the Northern Kingdom or Ephraim or Samaria. And there are all kinds of things about the lost tribes of Israel and all of that. And let me give you a, a hint. I don't believe any of it. There's no such thing as any lost tribes. They're not lost. Uh, what you had happen was all the idol worshipers went north, all the God worshipers went south. And I'll show you in the scriptures where it says they were actually all in the land at one time, but not as we're being promised here in Ezekiel with these two sticks. But Judah and Benjamin formed the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And it was fashionable for idol worshipers in the north. So, you know, and if you worship Yahweh, if you worship God, you move south. So all the Levites came south because they worshiped God. Uh, those who were in the tribe of Judah and Benjamin who liked worshiping Baal and were into all the other things that they did with the temple worship uh, going through the uh, false gods, they went north. Uh, but the idol worshipers, they all went north and the god worshipers moved south. In 722 B.C., the northern kingdom falls to Assyria. So from 931 to 722, you have two kingdoms. And because there is not one good king ever in the northern kingdom. They are all vile sinners. Uh, God took them into captivity in 722 B.C. as a lesson to Judah. Judah, don't do this. Stop doing what you're doing. See what I'm doing here. Follow me, and that won't have happen to you. Uh, but Judah, as we know, didn't learn the lesson. We've been reading about that in the first portion of the book of Ezekiel where he goes over and over and over that Jerusalem and Judah aren't following the Lord. They're blowing it, they're blowing it, they're blowing it. So what happens is during the ministry of Ezekiel in 585 B.C., they go into captivity and the city falls. Literally there are three captivities that take place. You have the first one that involves some of the leaders of Judah being taken away, and that included a guy named Daniel and several other of his friends. They were taken into captivity. There's a second captivity 
where Ezekiel and all of the leaders, the remaining leaders and the army leaders, all go to captivity to Babylon. Then the final captivity, Nebuchadnezzar just comes in and kills everybody. Not much of a captivity. Those who remain alive, a few of them, they were taken to captivity. But that happened in 585 B.C. So here you have Ezekiel. He's teaching. These people now know that their nation has gone away, that the temple has been destroyed. There's nobody in Israel now. Nobody. Uh, They're all in captivity. The northern kingdom has disappeared into Assyria. The southern kingdom has gone into Babylon. Babylon has conquered Assyria, and that's all now Babylon. And they're despondent. The temple's gone. Well, the northern kingdom has been gone over 200 years. So into that world comes the message of God. And God tells Ezekiel, take a stick, label, label it for Judah, and add to it, and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Why the addition? Again, there are not 10 lost tribes. He's talking about the other tribes for Judah and his, for Israel and his companions, the sons of Israel, the northern kingdom, Judah and the northern kingdom and his companions. That's what he's talking about. The command to Ezekiel to write upon this one piece of wood, not only Judah, but the sons of Israel, comes up from the circumstances that the kingdom of Judah also includes Benjamin and Simeon and Levi and all the God worshipers, all those who came south. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, we see where some of this actually is taking place. Asa is a good king. He's one of the good kings that we have in Judah. Now when Asa heard these words in the prophecy which Azariah, the son of Oded, the prophet spoke, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. He restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin. And then catch this, who else is there? And those from Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon who resided with them. So much for ten lost tribes, you're already seeing some of them are residing in Judah. And it says, for many defected to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord, his God, was with him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 11, we see some additional folks who are in Judah. Nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. They're there. They're they're not all missing. Uh, Now, on the other stick, Ezekiel has to write for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions. Again, the same thought. Not everyone in those tribes remained in the north. The God worshipers went south. We saw that. So now he writes on these two sticks, and he has to put both of them in one hand. So he's got two sticks in one hand, and he's standing in front of everybody. And they see those two sticks, and they're going like, okay, why is he holding them in one hand? What's that all about? What's going on here? What he's saying is God's going to make these two sticks into one stick again in some future day. By the way, how many kingdoms do we have in Israel today? One, right? How many rulers are in Israel today? One, right? They don't identify themselves as Judah and Ephraim. They're all in one land under one ruler. We're seeing some of this already happening today. But not only would they return from exile in the future, from all over the planet, not just from the northern area, but from everywhere. There's a term for that that they use in the Hebrew now. They call it Aliyah. And that's, there's two 747s that leave from Miami annually with folks moving back to Israel from the Miami area, and they don't come home, they don't come back here. They now live in Israel. And that's that's going on worldwide. But not only would they return from exile in the future, but God's going to bring them all back after being from the land a very long time. Because remember, we saw that with the dry bones, that they're dry, it's, it's been a long time. And they're going to remain return as one. So at the end of the exile, how many tribes return to Israel? Well, we know at least three. But it's not all of them. We know that it wasn't a mass migration of everyone. Even Judah didn't come back. A lot of folks stayed in Babylon. There's a reason why one of the reference books that we have that we study to understand a little bit about what was going on in the uh, nation of Israel during this time period, we use a, a book called the Babylonian Talmud. It was written around the time of Jesus Christ. There was a bunch of folks from Israel still living in Babylon then. Babylon still existed. 
But we do find in the book of Ezra that there is representation of folks returning from all 12 tribes. You see it, and the, there's some tribes listed in Ezra 1, some in 2. Was it a complete return? No. It's not everybody. It's not what he's talking about that we studied last week at the first part of chapter 37, and it's not what he's talking about with the two sticks. In hindsight, we know that there's another exile that's going to take place. It's going to kick off with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Jesus said that was going to happen. And it's further added to in 135 AD under the Bar Kokhba rebellion when Rome, Rome comes in, says, I'm done with you guys. They force the Jews to leave. In fact, it becomes against the law for a Jew to live in Jerusalem or in the Promised Land. And they're, and they're gone for almost 2,000 years. So we come to Ezra chapter 6. Again, talking about Ezra and, and that everybody did return, but not the same numbers we look at. In Ezra chapter 6, verses 16 to 21, we see this. And the sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. This is after the temple had been rebuilt the second time. And they offered for the dedication of this temple of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats. That means they were representatives of all 12 tribes there. That's what that's talking about. The rest of it just says they had a really good barbecue. But it says corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. Then they appointed the priests. I'm not being flippant, by the way. That, what, there, is a, there is a type of worship that takes place. It's in the book of Leviticus. It's a fellowshipping, and it, do, it does mean they eat these animals. They just don't burn them, uh, all of them. But some they do, but there's a meal that takes place. Now, then they appointed the priests to their divisions and the Levites and their orders for the service of God in Jerusalem as it's written in the book of Moses. The exiles observed the Passover on the 14th of the first month for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were pure. Then they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, both for their brothers and the priests and for themselves, the sons of Israel, the sons of Israel, not the sons of Judah, the sons of Israel. They're talking about the whole nation, but not the whole, whole nation as we're seeing here, had returned from exile and all those who had separated themselves from the impurity of the nations of the land to join them to seek the Lord God of Israel, they ate the Passover. So when Israel returns to the land in the future return, being referenced, who returns then? So we see that there's some that came back with Ezra, but not all. Uh, like 40,000, that was it. The rest of them all stayed out. In Hosea 1, verse 11, it says, the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. And they'll point for themselves one leader. And they'll go up from the land for, a, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Again, they have one leader today. They don't have multiple ones. They have one, just one. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 12 to 13. He will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed from Judah, from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who harass Judah will be cut off Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. So we see this same scenario that we've already talked about. It's already, but not quite yet. We know they came back, but not as what Ezekiel's talking about. They're going to be coming back as a single nation with a single ruler. Who is the ruler over Israel when they come back under Ezra? Some guy living in Persia. They don't have the freedom to appoint their own rulers. They are vassals of the Persian state. They never were able to have another ruler that they select, not really. There's a small period of time after they kicked uh, Antiochus Epiphanes out that they had their own ruler, but that didn't last very long. They've had one ruler, though, since 1948. Today's message was in the book of Ezekiel. Pastor Ken continues his teaching from this major prophet here on the Unsafe Bible. Ezekiel provides many reminders of what it means to be a Christian. Even more impressive is how relevant his example is even today. Not only did he embody what would later be known as a disciple, but he spoke of the end times that would later be penned in the book of Revelation. He also embodies what we mean when we say the Unsafe Bible. The Jews were saved by faith and blessed with a paradise to live in. This was not popular among the locals, and so little by little they began to deny their faith and take credit for themselves. 
This gained them favor with the world, but God took notice and knew what he must do. You see, the life of a Christian is not an easy one. Not only do you have to deny yourself things of this world, but the world begins to look at you differently, and that can be uncomfortable at times. We want to help you navigate what it means to be a Christian today and to walk in lockstep with God. Visit our website, theunsafebible.com, for more information about us and the Bible. You can connect with us by filling out the Connect form right on the main page. You'll find directions to our campus on the About tab under Contact Us. There's also a link to our email address where you can ask questions or leave a prayer request. We can't wait to hear from you and start a conversation. But for now, we're out of time. Be sure to come back for more from Pastor Ken on the Unsafe Bible.